This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for July 6, 2022. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, last week the FDA convened an advisory committee to discuss the possible composition of COVID vaccines for the coming fall. There are many unknowns, so it's a difficult decision. Today, let's talk about what we know about vaccines and where the uncertainties lie. Let's start with some data in which we have confidence. How are our current vaccines working today? Steve, there's a lot of published information out there, but I'm not sure you even need those data to understand what's going on. All you have to do is look around. Lots of people are getting COVID still, and many of them have been vaccinated or previously infected. So it's clear that vaccines and the immunity induced by prior infection are not perfect. We know there are two basic issues. One is that immunity decreases with time, and sometimes it really drops off markedly. There is evidence that people, particularly those who've only received two doses of vaccine, may be just as susceptible to the currently circulating strains as people who are unvaccinated. In addition, of course, new variants keep popping up, and they've been selected for their ability to infect people who have an immune response already. And so as each new wave comes in, there are more infections that are bypassing any immunity that has been raised before. Now, having said that, the vaccines are still working because they do protect against more severe disease, despite the fact that there is waning immunity and despite the fact that there's viral variation. So they're working. They're just not preventing the spread of disease any longer in the way that we'd want. One other thing that we know for sure is that boosting is key. In particular, it's important to receive a second dose of vaccine as a first dose of vaccine has very limited efficacy. And there is a substantial difference between a second dose and a third dose, with a third dose offering much longer lasting protection, particularly against severe disease. So Eric, you raised several very important points conceptually that I think we have to continue to pay attention to. We are watching natural selection. And what I mean by that is as the virus and our response to the virus with vaccine penetrate throughout society, there is hybrid immunity. That hybrid immunity is best against the circulating strain. So when alpha or D614G was circulating, high levels of immunity against this variant was engendered. Then beta came along and we witnessed and data from South Africa very nicely demonstrated how the beta variant was able to infect those who had had the ancestral strain, but the ancestral strain did not infect as well those who had beta. We see that again with BA.4.5 versus BA.1 because the new variant, as you suggest, has to figure out how to escape the immunity elicited by an earlier variant or it won't be selected. So there is ongoing virologic selection across the population for a new variant that is able to establish replication in the context of prior hybrid immunity, both from vaccination and from prior infection. And that's what BA.4.5 is doing now in the wake of BA.1. Delta did this in the wake of alpha and beta. So This should not be a surprise, and it does mean that when we see new variants circulating in the community, it is telling us about the biology of prior immunity through a natural selection. We also need to understand what we want from protection, as you suggest, and it's infection versus disease. And even though immunity wanes with time, I still am not certain if that is a substantial undoing of the power of vaccination. And there we've seen with smallpox, with polio, with measles, with mumps, vaccination occurs, there is some waning of immunity, but we continue to have substantial protection. Some vaccines have higher levels of protection for longer periods of time, but there still are substantial levels of protection. And we have to think about that as we evolve our understanding of SARS-CoV-2 and the dominant variant circulating. What is the goal? of vaccination, what is the goal of our precautions, and how we think about disease, which is significant illness, typically leading to hospitalization and more severe complications, 
versus infection, which may boost immunity, which also speaks to compartment. Does the systemic compartment and the mucosal compartment, such as our upper airways and even our lower airways in the lung, because the lung is a non-sterile site, and how does immunity penetrate these spaces and block or abrogate viral replication and the establishment of infection and the subsequent development of significant illness? And I think that the last issue that we do have to pay attention to are sociologic forces, which is transmission dynamics. And there, as we change our behavior, stop wearing masks, resume interacting in close proximity, indoors, there will be more transmission. And as we now have scaled up testing so that we can test ourselves at home and at our own discretion, we lose our ability to be able to track. And so our understanding of the burden of transmission and the burden of transmission that may be less severe illness, mild illness in particular, becomes very hard to follow from a public health and a scientific standpoint because of the good news that I can test myself whenever I want. But the bad news is there's no way to track that. So we don't really understand the burden of mild illness. Therefore, understanding how significant is a new variant in the severity of illness it may induce. Lindsay, I'd like to pick up on one of the many things you said there, and that is the distinction between immunity induced by vaccination and that induced by infection. There was the hope that immunity induced by infection would be long lasting and prevent subsequent infection. It looks now as if there is good immunity induced by infection. There's even better immunity induced by a combination of infection and vaccination. However, it's still imperfect. It still does not prevent new infection. And the viral strains that we're looking at right now, the ones that are emerging, are being selected on the background of both kinds of immunity. So it's not clear that one is better or worse than the other. There probably are some quantitative differences, but we can kind of view them collectively rather than as very unique responses. Let's get into an area that's less clear. How much of a difference does changing the antigen contained in the vaccine make? There have been efforts to induce immunity to variants that have been published in the past, but not very many. We published a study looking at a beta variant spike protein that induced immunity that appeared to be somewhat different from the immunity seen with the ancestral strain, which is contained in all of the current vaccines. This past week, the FDA was presented data from two different manufacturers, from Pfizer and from Moderna, on boosting with mRNA that encoded the spike protein derived from BA1, which is the original Omicron variant, or with a mixture of the original antigen, the ancestral antigen, and the Omicron spike protein. None of these data are published, so I want to start with that caveat. But to summarize the data that were presented, it was clear that an Omicron-derived antigen did increase the Omicron-specific antibodies in the recipients. But remember a couple of things. First, that all of these endpoints were only antibody endpoints. So we don't know how well those translate. There have been no efficacy results reported. So we don't know how well these protect against disease from Omicron or Omicron-related viruses. And then to generalize a bit here, the antibody titers increased, but they roughly doubled. And we don't know if that is a clinically significant value. So I think these are difficult data to interpret. Importantly, I just said that they didn't look at efficacy. They didn't report protection by these vaccines. But remember that the circulating virus right now is not BA1, it's other Omicron-related sequences, particularly BA4 and BA5, which do differ from the parental. And so these vaccines might or might not offer protection, but they're being tested against a different virus than they were raised. So Eric and Steve, as you both know, I'm one of the scientists involved in vaccine development research, particularly with the initial vaccine and now as we try to improve the vaccine. And some of my reflections on the issues raised, because as pointed out, they're complex and we're really challenged with the need to make decisions in the near term with imperfect data. 
And how do we leverage imperfect data to make the smartest decisions possible, given the speed with which this virus is moving and evolving? One of the things I gleaned from the FDA meeting and the other comments in the field is our understanding of the platform and the attractiveness of platforms like mRNA technology that is very fast and nimble. So all one needs largely is to determine a sequence of interest. And like ordering primers, as an analogy, one can design a vaccine that can go into manufacturing very rapidly. This is incredibly attractive about the platform. And as we understand more about the safety, the ability to manufacture, the scalability, and the ability of the novel vaccine to likely elicit immune responses of interest. This all together is encouraging in our ability to respond quickly. However, there are still many questions that we don't have answers to, such as how does different variations of the amount of antigen in a vaccine, does it matter if you receive a higher level of antigen A or a half a dose of antigen A and half a dose of antigen B? And what are the implications in the quality and quantity of the immune response elicited? And as you mentioned, Eric, the doubling of antibody titer is attractive and reassuring and encouraging. But what does it mean? And what does it mean as we think about a vaccine against a given strain and the antibodies elicited against other strains, an alpha vaccine, and a beta, delta, BA1, BA4, 5 titers elicited. And even these titers, how much is binding antibody or neutralizing antibody, let alone the T cell responses? So is, there's much we don't know. However, we have learned over the last two years that by eliciting neutralizing antibody, that predicts the ability to be protected against breakthrough infection and illness. Now, granted, that was earlier in the pandemic and with earlier strains, but it's very encouraging that this is an important parameter that is associated and predictive of protection. But it is very complicated immunologically, and we at this point in time are making decisions from early phase one, two clinical studies that allow us insight into safety and immunogenicity through two weeks or four weeks but not three months or six months, getting to the point of durability and durability with which types of immune response. Unfortunately, we don't have the time as a community to wait six to 12 months for complete data sets to make decisions. We have to make decisions in the next weeks to month or two in order to be prepared for the fall, where many of us are concerned with colder weather and more indoor crowding there may be much higher risks of large-scale transmission. So it is science at its best. It's science at its most challenging as we try to decide which lines of evidence are most important for us to make pivotal public health decisions. I'd like to draw the comparison and contrast this with what goes on with the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is different every year. It's designed in the spring for a fall flu season each year. And there are variable quality data that go into that decision, very much like where we have right now, although there's a, certainly science to it. And the vaccines are based on vaccines that have been around for many, many years. So we know a lot about their safety and their immunogenicity, even though they aren't extensively tested in people every year. And what we get out of that are good guesses in some years and less good guesses in other years. Here, there are a lot more variables. First, we have much less experience with varying vaccines. As you said, Lindsay, this is the first experience in a very small number of people with mixing two antigens together and seeing how that affects the immune response. And of course, the biology of the disease is very different. Flu has a very defined seasonality. We don't know that there is going to be such a seasonality to SARS-CoV-2. In fact, we know that many of the variants have arisen at really varying times through the year. So the fall, which has been the big focus of the FDA, makes a lot of sense for the reason that you said that it's going to get cold, people are going to get 
indoors again, and there's going to be more exposure and more opportunities for the virus to spread and to mutate and form new variants. At the same time, those variants still could arise off cycle, and it's going to be far more difficult to predict when that will occur and what we will see. So taking a step back, is Omicron the right target? What do we know about the viral variants that will be circulating this fall? I think we don't know that much, fundamentally. Omicron has been a very successful variant. But remember that the Omicron to which these vaccines are designed, BA1, is extinct. We don't see it anymore. It's been replaced by the variants like BA4 and BA5. And these guys are pretty successful, even though BA1 was already successful. So there are enough differences between BA4 and BA5 and the original BA1 Omicron to still lead to very large numbers of cases. So those differences might be important. And it may be that we continue to drift through various Omicron-related strains into the fall and that those will be the major causes of disease. But of course, there may be even more successful viruses that are not related to Omicron that arise because of the same immune pressures. The FDA has recommended to manufacturers that they produce vaccines that target BA4 and BA5, the current strains that are circulating, which makes some sense. But it's important to remember, we have no data. We have no vaccines currently that target BA4 and BA5. So we are basing those decisions on vaccines that were designed for BA1 and for which the data are relatively short and the number of people vaccinated is small. There have been lots of efforts to predict what's going to happen, what the new viruses will look like, but there are just so many variables. I think it really is impossible to make those predictions. So I sound very nihilistic here. There are so many things we don't know, but at the same time, we do have to make decisions. And so I'm not trying to second guess the FDA in any way. This is a reasonable conclusion for them to draw, but it's very difficult to know how successful it will be. So I think that we have to get precise with our language. And I think Omicron has confused us. I look at it as BA1 versus BA4, 5, or potentially future variants. It's not one grouping that has the same immunology. And I think that is teaching us a lot about this virus and about our ability to respond to it, even linguistically. Omicron or BA1 only emerged in early November, arrived here late November, early December, dominated through the holidays, January, February, and is now being replaced and largely has been, as you point out, Eric. That is the speed of this virus and therefore requires the speed of our response. And as we think about what vaccine we want come October, as you point out, Eric, the FDA is trying to be forward-looking and trying to learn from the biology that we have uncovered over the last year or two with how variants replace prior variants through natural selection and biologic efficiency. Delta did this. BA1 did this. BA4.5, for example, are doing it. And it's doing it over a time frame that is a couple of months, if not shorter, given that our detection modalities have limitations. So as we develop countermeasures and vaccines, how do we think about which vaccine would be ideal in October, November? It would be the vaccine that matches the sequence that's circulating. And how do we know that? And that, I think, is a real challenge. And I applaud the FDA for trying to be forward-looking as to what would be the most relevant immunogen against what's circulating. The challenge is the biology of this virus and our inability to accurately predict what's likely to happen. It does make sense to be utilizing the latest sequence. And as you point out, Eric, with influenza, where we have decades and decades of experience, But that technology of vaccine manufacturing takes many, many months and requires manipulation of the virus to be egg adapted and other features to enhance the vaccine manufacturing. Those are features that are challenges in flu vaccine manufacturing, but we've figured it out and been able to apply it in a way that we have a new vaccine that is matched or we try to match to the circulating strain. 
With SARS-CoV-2, that cycle time is so much shorter. And the fact that it is transmitting year round, not just seasonally, means that every quarter or a little more, there seems to be a new variant of concern that's emerging. And it requires us to respond in a similar facile manner. So I think the current vaccine technologies and platforms are terrific. How to leverage them in relation to the speed of the virus is the real challenge. And the manufacturing isn't a light switch. We can't make a decision today and have a billion doses tomorrow. It requires a certain amount of manufacturing, scaling up, and at least basic testing to make sure it behaves the way we want it to, to have some confidence it's likely to afford benefit. So I think we're better off than we've ever been, but we're up against a pathogen that at least right now is evolving at a very rapid clip in relation to the community immunity that we discussed earlier. And even, Eric and Stephen, my comment about a billion doses, we really need to be thinking about doses for 7 billion people, not just for 300 million in our country or North America. It's a global virus, and we need to think about scalability to all on the planet who are vulnerable, something that we all too often lose sight of. So this is a long list of challenges. Given all the issues you raise, how do we choose the next vaccine candidate? I think Lindsay has addressed this in a way. It's really hard. I really also applaud the FDA for being forward looking here and trying to anticipate what a virus might look like. But we've already talked about the limitations. The antigens being tested in the current round are for a virus that no longer exists, that the data from those don't suggest a dramatic improvement. And we don't know anything about the longevity of responses so that they could very well wane in a way that we've seen with other boosts. That being said, if the goal is to protect against severe disease, it's likely that these vaccines will do that, and they might well do it better than the vaccines we're using now because the antigens are better matched, even if they're not perfectly matched, to what's out there. The big question for me is, can we have an effect on transmission? And I think both Lindsay and I have made the point before that transforming a deadly disease to a minor illness may be more important than blocking transmission. However, I wouldn't give up on the idea of blocking transmission. It's relatively clear right now, though, that the current vaccine approaches are not going to produce long-lasting effects on the numbers, and that we will need to do something different if we want to do that. Lindsay mentioned the idea of mucosal vaccines or inducing mucosal immunity. That's one way that one might think about it. But if we're going to take that as a goal, then we probably need to be doing something different. So, Eric, I think that it's important to separate infection and progression to disease and transmission, as you've done. And appropriately, the community work over the last two years has been heavily focused on the scientific process to bring forward countermeasures that prevent progression to severe illness. And I do think we've been highly successful at that. As I look back to when I was on service a year, year and a half ago, and we had hundreds of patients admitted, healthy people with severe illness. Now I'm on service again, but the patients who are admitted with COVID are those who are unvaccinated, and those who have a weakened immune system. And I think we need to think a bit about what are the goals of vaccination? And I think, who do we want to protect? And I think we need to protect all who have not been vaccinated. They do need to be vaccinated. And as you mentioned, Eric, if you've been infected and then vaccinated, it's still a stronger immune response than if you've only been infected. And so there are ways to enhance immunity that we should be educating the community about and offering the tools to all who may benefit. We also need to think about those who can't respond to a vaccine, such as our immunocompromised patients, our cancer patients, those who have weakened immune systems. And it is incredibly frustrating right now for me to have patients with cancer undergoing cancer therapy who have their cancer therapy altered because they have an uncontrolled viral infection they can't get rid of. And this is a month or two into the infection. They have prolonged infection, and this impairs our ability 
to treat their underlying conditions, which desperately need to be treated as cancer, as we all know, can be quite unforgiving. And it is incredibly important to receive cycles of treatment on time. So I think we need to think about our tools and how we can apply those tools to those who can most benefit. And then to your point, Eric, about transmission, which is an area that has not been adequately studied. Maybe it requires different technologies. Maybe it requires different clinical studies to understand how our current technologies best work, be they vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, or some of the other treatments which we now have available. And I do think we have to develop a more rigorous science to understand mucosal infection and the associated transmissibility of the virus. And this is an area that I don't think has received enough attention and will become very important as we really try to understand how to control spread. And I link that to controlling spread in the sense of mask wearing. I wear a mask to protect you. And you may be someone who needs advanced medical care, who have a weakened immune system, who are elderly, and to understand how to block transmission through vaccine use, as well as behavior such as mask wearing is something we all need to better understand so we can really apply the best techniques to block transmission and to block transmission to those who can least handle the virus and have severe associated illness. So I think we are in such a better place compared to a year or two ago, but we still have much work to be done to really control the spread of this virus and those who suffer the most from it. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.